Hi, everyone. Welcome to your first lecture for Chem 104. My name is Dr. Aaliyah Hefner, and I will be guiding you through this journey of distance learning with Chem 104. Um, we're going to have live sessions in Blackboard using Collaborate Ultra, but we're also going to have these lectures that I'm going to post on YouTube, and I'll potentially um, post them to media site as well. Um, either way, you will have a stack of these lectures to reference, and at your leisure, you can watch these videos and take notes and prepare for class on Tuesday morning. So welcome if you're a freshman. Welcome back if you're not. And let's get started. Obviously, we're starting with Chapter 1. We're going to talk about chemistry in our lives. We're going to talk about study skills and just do some basic brush up on math that if you haven't taken math in a while or maybe math wasn't your friend, then we'll just kind of make sure that everyone's on even footing. And don't be shy about asking questions or being like, hey, you know, I don't really know if I got that. I don't know if I really understood in the first place. That's what this is for. Um, because once we really start going, as in once we hit Chapter 2, we're going to need math. So make sure that you have your calculator, make sure you're comfortable with it, and you can always ask for help. So without further ado, let's get started. We have chemistry all around us. Um, we have this picture of this person pipetting into some PCR tubes. Um, forensic scientists, everyone's heard of like CSI and NCIS and that sort of thing. Um, it's not exactly that glamorous, but yes, that happens. And so people who work for these crime laboratories analyze bodily fluids and tissue samples and all those types of things. If you go to the doctor and you get any kind of blood work, you can get tissue samples done there too, biopsies. All of that is chemistry. In the first section of this chapter, we're going to talk about what chemistry is and what chemicals are. Um, what we have here is an image of hemoglobin, which is a protein, and it transports oxygen to all the tissues and it gets all the carbon dioxide that's made from metabolic processes to the lungs so you can breathe it out. What is chemistry? Sometimes I ask myself that. <laughs> the definition that we are going to work with is the study of the composition, structure, properties, and reactions of matter. Chemistry absolutely happens every day all around you. And the example we have here in this picture on the right is putting an antacid tablet into water. Now, hopefully, you haven't had to do this. Y'all ain't old enough. But maybe your grandmama had to. Or if someone's been pregnant or you've seen your mom be pregnant and you get upset stomach. I'm pregnant with number four, so pregnancy is heavy on the brain, y'all. Sometimes your stomach don't be doing right and you need a little antacid, okay? That is a chemical reaction. Just one of the many examples. If you cook, lots of chemical reactions in cooking and baking. Um, so it's really all around us. Chemistry happens with matter. And matter is another word that's just all the substances that make up everything in the world. So anything that you can touch, the air that you breathe, all that stuff is matter. So if we go back to our example of the antacid in water, the tablets are matter, the water is matter, the glass that everything is in is matter, the air around the glass is matter, everything is matter. Chemicals are the substances that have the same composition and properties wherever they're found. Chemicals partake in chemistry. And oftentimes, all the stuff that you use, so let's say that you're going to class on campus, maybe you have some face-to-face -face classes, or you're getting ready for work, you're going to take a shower, please. It's hot, it's summertime, take a shower. You're going to use some deodorant, maybe, antiperspirant, something. You're going to put something in your hair, maybe, just a little dry. All of those things 
have chemicals in them. You're going to brush your teeth, maybe do some mouthwash. All of those things are made up of chemicals. In toothpaste, is the example we're going to use, it's a combination of many chemicals, and all those chemicals play a role in keeping your teeth clean, getting rid of plaque. So there's, here, table 1.1 has chemicals that are commonly found in toothpaste. So calcium carbonate is an abrasive. So if you ever feel like if you're using that crest or that Colgate and you kind of feel something scrubbing against your teeth, that is calcium carbonate or something that's kind of like rough on the teeth. Sorbitol makes sure that you don't have toothpaste that becomes hard as a rock. Over time, if you didn't have sorbitol in that toothpaste, it would just start to lose moisture and it would just become like cement in the tube, and that ain't that ain't helpful. Sodium lauryl sulfate is used to loosen up plaque. You'll also see it in body wash and soap. Titanium dioxide makes the toothpaste white. Sodium fluorophosphate, the fluorine helps to prevent cavities, so it strengthens your tooth enamel. And methyl salicylate it gives that toothpaste the taste that you're used to, that wintergreen flavor, that mintiness. That's what that is. So chemicals, they're wonderful. We use them every day. Wouldn't be life without them. So this is just a quick learning check. You'll see these throughout the chapters. Which of the following contains chemicals? We've got sunlight, fruit, milk, and breakfast cereal. It's not a trick question. And you can select more than one answer. With these learning checks, I would suggest that, especially as we get on to the meteor chapters, that you pause here, give it an actual try before you keep watching the video for the answer. So I'll always go over the answer, explain the answer. If it's a math question, I will do the math, pull out. So you don't have to worry about missing out on the answer. Just make sure you actually try it in your notebook because you want to make sure that you understand what's going on. This question you probably don't need to keep in your notebook. I think you can answer it without without the sound of my voice, but I'll go through it anyway. So the answer is, which of them contain chemicals? All of them, except for sunlight. So sunlight is energy. doesn't have any chemicals in it. But fruit, milk, breakfast cereal, all contain chemicals. So that was the first section, just introducing the terminology of chemistry, chemicals, thinking about things in terms of being comprised of a bunch of different chemicals. In this next section, we're going to think like scientists. We're going to talk about the scientific method. So the man that you see on the right, his name is Linus Pauling. He won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1954, and he's kind of known as the father of molecular biology. He's done a lot of work with DNA, proteins, and kind of built a lot of foundation for some of the things that we take for granted and a lot of the things that we learn in our biology classes and biochemistry classes, the um, 100 and 200 level courses. So he's done a lot of work. Um, you don't have to know who Linus Pauling is, really. That's just me sharing with you who this random white man is on this PowerPoint so that you're not like, okay, that's great. So the scientific method, obviously, if you're willing, winning the Nobel Prize in chemistry, you're using the scientific method in some way, shape, or form. And this method is just a set of principles that helps describe how a scientist thinks. And honestly, I like to expand it beyond scientists. Everyone kind of thinks in this way, whether we use these terms to describe how we think or not, we're thinking like scientists. We all make observations about the world that we're in. And sometimes you have questions about what you're observing. So I'll try to underline these words. So we talked about observations. We observe nature, ask questions about what you're seeing. And when you see something that always seems to happen repeatedly, it seems to be true, 
maybe there's some kind of a law that you can write. Maybe there's something that you can measure. Maybe there's some more information that you can glean from this. So you propose a hypothesis, kind of how things work. What's the possible explanation for what it is that you're observing? So you write a hypothesis. Then you perform some kind of an experiment to find the relationship between your hypothesis and the observation. Thinking about those experiments and having them be meaningful in a way that can actually show whether your hypothesis has some weight to it or if it's full of baloney, that's a really hard thing to do. And you have to kind of go through that process of writing a hypothesis, experimenting, and then going back up to the drawing board and kind of revisiting your hypothesis, modifying it, and kind of in that loop until you kind of hit the nail on the head. Then you make a conclusion about your hypothesis. So you say, okay, we finally got it. Maybe it's true. Or maybe this observation, we can't explain it with this hypothesis, so we have to completely scrap it. So it's a process. It's not just a linear, okay, we make an observation, then there's a hypothesis, we do an experiment, and then we're done, yay. It's something that you're constantly doing, and you can literally make a lifetime out of trying to explain one simple observation in nature. So this is kind of a silly example, but it gives you a better idea, something more concrete to think about, you know, observations, hypothesis, experiments a way to use these terms. So let's say that you visit a friend, and after you get there, you start sneezing. This has happened to me, actually, in real life. I didn't write this example, but this has low-key actually happened to me in my adult life. You observe that your friend has a new cat, and you're like, hmm, why am I sneezing? Maybe I'm allergic to cats, because this cat is new. So you perform an experiment. You go visit other people that have cats. Do you still feel the same way? You still sneezy and sad? If you're still sneezing and stuff after you've visited other places with cats, maybe you conclude that, yeah, I might be allergic. Now, you might want to throw in some tests to maybe go see a dog or a fish, you know, something like that to see if it was just some, some other new thing that you didn't observe. But in a nutshell, that's using the scientific method. And in real life, a friend of mine was a foster pet parent, and she got a cat and two kittens. Cute as could be, you wouldn't even know that they were there unless they just kind of happened upon your lap. And I just couldn't breathe. Literally, I was like, why am I gasping for air? I found out I was allergic to cats that day. So that's real real life. So now, when you think about observe, hypothesis, experiments, and conclusion, you'll think about how Dr. Hefner almost lost her life because of a cat. And then you'll remember the scientific method. So this cat, see this evil eyes. I don't like that. Them eyes are evil. Me and cats don't get along. Enough of the silly stuff. All right. So, you go through the scientific method. You observe something. You write a hypothesis. You experiment. You kind of modify the hypothesis as you go along. And then you find some kind of conclusion. Maybe you write a theory that takes all the data and the stuff you've learned about whatever system you're observing. You write a theory about it. Maybe there's some kind of natural law that comes from it. But again, this is a process a lengthy process. It involves a lot of thinking and analyzing, and um, it actually takes a lot of people. You're not just doing this in a vacuum by yourself. So to make sure that you understand what an observation is, what a hypothesis, an experiment, and a conclusion, there are three examples, and you're supposed to label them as being one of these four different terms. So take a second. Pause the, the lecture. I'll be here. Label it in your head. You don't necessarily have to write it down, um, but make sure that you get it right, okay? So hit that pause. Do it. 
they come right on back to me. I'm still here waiting for you. Okay. So, letter A. During your visit to the gym, your trainer records that you ran for 25 minutes on the treadmill. That's certainly not a conclusion. It's not an experiment. They just wrote something down. Is it a hypothesis? It doesn't sound like anyone is proposing how something works. So it sounds like an observation. So you're recording something. You're taking note of something. That's an observation. So I underline that records. And B, we have scientific studies show that exercising lowers blood pressure. The key here is that studies show. So that's some kind of a conclusion. We're looking at data, we're analyzing it, and coming up with some kind of a theory, coming up with some kind of a conclusion that summarizes everything that we've observed and all the results of our experiments. In letter C, it says, your doctor thinks that your weight loss is due to increased exercise. The key word here is thinks. That's a hypothesis. Because that's all a hypothesis is. You see something happen, and say, I think it happens because of this. That's a hypothesis. So make sure that those are pretty clear in your mind. And you can, um, so we're going to do examples of things in class, and I'll make sure that we have some more examples of observation, hypothesis, experiment, conclusion. And I'll have you guys also make up your own. So it'll be a little bit more involved than um, this learning check here. So make sure you understand those terms. And then we have the answers here. I like to write things down as we go, but I will also on occasion keep these solution slides in just in case I do a lot of writing and stuff and it's, this is a little bit more clear. So the next section, so we've covered chemistry, chemicals, we've covered the scientific method. Now we're going to talk about studying and learning chemistry, which is what you're going to be doing this semester among a million other things. We're going to talk kind of briefly. I'm not going to go through these slides in super detail. This is something that we're going to cover more in class because you may have questions about, you know, kind of what do you have to look forward to with the class in terms of exams, quizzes, homework, all of those types of things. And then we can talk as a group, and I'll break you up into groups for you to be able to brainstorm and potentially come up with your own study groups and things like that. So you have to have good study habits to do well. You need to be able to take the new information that you're getting with each lecture and build. Chemistry is cumulative. So you can't take in chapter one and two and three, have an exam, and then forget it all when we move on to chapter four. You need to build on everything and make sure that you're not forgetting the key concepts from each of the chapters. So that's one of the most difficult things, I think, about chemistry. When it comes to learning and understanding and studying for success, you have to be purposeful. Don't just reread your text book or your notes, but actually engage it. Reading a book is very different from reading information and then trying to take it and apply it to something new. So do the learning checks. Do practice problems that I offer you. If you want more practice problems because you realize, oh, you know, that still doesn't make sense to me, happy to give them to you. So that's what we're going to be doing mainly in lecture time is practice problems, especially when we're dealing with topics that are more math heavy. We're going to focus on practice. So you have the class participation assignments, the chapter check-ins, and then you have mastering chemistry, 
which has homework and quizzes. The homework questions, you, you have multiple chances to answer them correctly, and that will help you learn as well. Make sure that you're studying and doing your work and pacing yourself, because you cannot spend 10 hours the night before the exam and expect to do well. So the textbook has a lot of different um, sections that will help you. If you are using the textbook, then we can go over that in more detail. But these are this is just kind of a list of the types of things you'll see in each chapter or in the front cover or the back cover, so the periodic table. There's all different types of tables um, inside the back cover and throughout the chapters. There's a looking ahead piece at the beginning of the chapter that gives you an idea of what you're going to be reading about and learning about. The learning goals help you focus on what the chapter is really about so that you don't get lost in all the detail. There's usually some kind of a review at the beginning of each section. And then key math skills, we're always going to be hitting those and making sure that the math skills you need to do the problems, that you have those. Core chemistry skills, key terms, glossary and index, okay? So that's if you're using the textbook in addition to the lectures and things of that nature. The next few slides are going to kind of help you again with how to use the textbook. So we're kind of going to skim over that part and I'll let you ask more questions about it in class. I do want to talk about how to read the text. Don't just read it like you're reading a novel, but actually think about the questions that are there and test yourself. Work through the sample problems just like for these lectures. Review the analyze the problem sections that show you like um, how to organize your problem solving and try to practice problems. Don't just read. Don't just highlight, but actually try things out to make sure that you're understanding the knowledge and answering the questions correctly. Um, throughout the chapter, there's going to be some links to health, environment, clinical application problems. A lot of you are um, want to be in the nursing program or are in the nursing program. Some of you are psychology majors. So definitely linking to human health and the environment. Hopefully that will help keep things interesting to you. And I will do my best to add in those things as well, not just the ones that are provided in the textbook, but other things just from my walk in life, I'll try to throw those in too to help make it more relevant and give you more reason to, to actually understand it. Um, there's lots of figures and diagrams and there's interactive videos on mastering chemistry. So if you are a visual person, if you like videos, um, that's a, a great tool. And YouTube is great for that too. So. Don't feel like you're locked in to only my lectures and only the textbook. And if you find a video that you think is really good that really helped you, send it along. Share it with your classmates. Send it to me. Because if it's helpful, I want everyone to have access to it. At the end of the chapter, there's all types of study aids. So there's reviews. There's a concept map that kind of visually shows you how the different concepts and things that you've learned in the chapter are connected, terms, math skills, all that good stuff. So it pretty much gives you the, the rundown of all the stuff that, that you should be able to do, the terms you should know, the concepts that you should be adding from uh, that chapter to your brain. To do well, just in general, in college, you need to have some kind of a study plan, and that goes beyond the chemistry class, but just in general. You need to block time to study, to do homework, to read, and for self-care. Um, we don't talk about that too much, but if you don't take care of yourself, then you show enough ain't going to do your work. You're going to burn out. Four years is a long time. I can tell you that. And if you want to do anything after that, it's real long. So learning how to manage your time and take care of yourself is one of the biggest hurdles that you will have to overcome. It's a balancing act. So make sure that you're doing the things that you need to do to keep yourself healthy, 
not just, you know, not sick, but keep you mentally and emotionally healthy too so that you don't feel like, you know, you're depressed or you don't feel like you're drowning, you're overwhelmed. Because if you're feeling any of those things, you need to have someone around to know and reach out and help. In addition to that, having an actual study plan and blocking out your time so that you have a rough schedule each day of when you're going to do work and when you're going to take care of yourself or have some fun, um, which I know is COVID season, so that looks kind of different now. But even still, even if it's a, you know, FaceTime or a, a video chat with a friend, you know, and you do that all the time, maybe you're eating dinner in your respective rooms, but you're kind of eating together doing the face chat. Yes, I said face chat. I'm old. Get over it. So block your time out. Make sure there's plenty of time for studying. This is a three-credit course, so that means that you need to be spending about nine hours or so outside of class on this work. That may not be 100% realistic because you might have to work. Maybe you have kids or you have younger siblings. You obviously have other classes, but you need to be spending a sizable amount of time on your homework, on reading, and preparing for class. So make sure that you're not just, just going to class but that you're actually blocking out a decent amount of time for doing class-related things. I'm going to stop talking on this slide. All right. So we're going to talk more about how to study and, you know, the potential for making a study group, office hours, how to use those. Um, we'll talk more about that in the lecture on Tuesday. This is a learning check. It's a little silly. I feel silly reading it, but we're going to do it anyway. Which of the following activities should be included in your study plan for learning chemistry? Obviously, it's A, skipping class, right? You don't want to hear me? No. Um, forming a study group? Absolutely. Keeping a problem notebook? Not a bad idea. Working practice problems as you read each section? Also not a bad idea. So all of these are keepers. Skipping class? Probably not the best. There's an explanation, y'all. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. This is a real question. All right. Key math skills for chemistry. So we're going to be reviewing some things. Some of them you might be like, come on, man, I know this. But we just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page. So, again, don't be shy. Math is not everybody's friend. I didn't like math all the time. Sometimes I still don't like math, and I'm ready to fight it. That's okay. I'm here for you. So we're going to view, like, review all decimal places, positive and negative numbers, percentages, solving equations, and interpreting graphs. We're going to start with the uh, decimal places, so all the place values. For any number, there's place values for each digit. So if we're looking at, on the left here, our example, of a premature baby having a mass of 2,518 grams, the 2, the 5, the 1, the 8, they all have a place value. So if, the, if you're reading this number properly, it's 2,518 grams, right? So the thousands place, the hundreds place, the tens, and the ones. There's also place values on the other side of that decimal. So if we're looking at the mass of the silver coin, 6.407 grams. We've got the ones place, and that's the six. Then we cross over to the decimal side, and we have the tenths, hundredths, and thousandths. Okay? So you'll need to know these places. This is a quick learning check. This would be a good place to pause and make sure that you understand. I've also placed this uh, little image here to help you out that you can place the number in. It's helpful to just draw it in your notebook real quick. Sometimes you just draw a blank and you're like, wait, what is that one? So it's helpful. Pause here, try it, come back for the answer. 
what is the place value for the underlying digit in 35.679? So we're looking at the 7. Let's place it in here. Looking at the 7, that's the hundredths place. So it should be D. Now we're moving on to positive and negative numbers. Positive numbers we work with all the time. You generally don't see a plus sign in front of a positive number. It's kind of implied and understood, but it's there. Okay, So anything greater than zero is a positive number. Negative number is less than zero, always written with a negative sign, never implied. Quick recap of multiplying and dividing with positive and negative numbers. If you have two positive numbers or two negative numbers, your answer is going to be positive. So if you're doing 2 times 2, that equals 4. Negative 2 times negative 2 also equals 4. And that plus sign is understood. So both of those will give you a positive number. Likewise, if we said 2 divided by 2, that equals 1. Negative 2 divided by negative 2 also equals 1. When you're taking a positive number and a negative number and you're doing multiplication or division, the answer is going to be negative. So if I said 2 times negative 2, that gives you negative 4. And likewise, 2 divided by negative 2 will give you a negative 1. Addition, and uh, we're going to sort of talk about subtraction, too. So when you add two positive numbers, the answer is positive. I like twos. When you add two negative numbers, the answer is going to be negative. So if I said negative 2 plus negative 2, that really looks like it's negative 2 minus 2. And that makes it more negative, so negative 4. If you've got a positive and a negative number, then we have a few more caveats. So let's say that we had 4 plus a negative 2. That's going to be 2. Your positive number is bigger than your negative number. I'm going to use my greater than sign. So that means the sign of your answer is going to be positive. But let's say we flipped it and we said negative 4 plus 2. That's going to be negative 2. This is an example of your positive number being less than your negative number. You can't overcome it. Okay? So the sign of your answer is going to be negative. We'll do some quick examples in class to make sure everybody's on the same page. Now we're going to talk about subtraction for real for real. When you've got two numbers and you're subtracting them, you're going to change the sign of the number to be subtracted, and then you follow the rules for addition. So if we had a negative 4 minus, say, negative 2, that would actually be negative 4 plus 2, and we'd get our same negative 2 result. If we had negative 4 minus 5, 
then that would just be straight up negative 4. You subtract another 5, and you get a negative 9. Again, we'll do more examples. Thankfully, we have calculators. So you may not have to do that by hand without the aid of your calculator. But with that being said, you need to make sure that you know how to use your calculator. To do negative numbers, you're going to need to find the change sign key. And it has a few different flavors of calculators. These are scientific calculators, and a couple of them are graphing calculators. You don't need to have a graphing calculator for the class, but you definitely need a scientific calculator. And you can get one for like 20 bucks, or you can see if you can borrow one from someone who's taken a class like this uh, previously. So I've circled where the change sign key is. It's usually something like that. And it's got a negative sign in parentheses. So on the Casios, it's kind of on the left-hand side towards the middle. On the TI 83 and 89, it's on the bottom, bottom right. So know where that sign is. We're also going to be using exponents um, and doing scientific notation and you're also going to need to know how to do that on your calculator. So if you do not feel comfortable using your calculator, you can look it up on Google. Google knows it all. Or you can ask me. I may not know your exact brand of calculator, but if it's a TI-89 or an 83 or something like that, I can help you out. So these are just examples of how to use your calculator. I'm not going to go over this in detail. But again, if you need help using your calculator, that's what I'm here for too. So please don't be ashamed. If you don't ask, then you won't get the help you need and you won't do as well as you could do. On to percentages. I told you we're running through all the key math skills. So just to remind you what a percentage is, you're taking a part and you are dividing by the total multiplying by 100. So let's say for a grade that you scored 85 out of the possible 100 points and you multiply that by 100% to get 85%. So grades are a great way to think about percentages because it's something that we can all kind of relate to. If the percentage of red balls is 5, it means there are 5 red balls in every 100 balls. So what that looks like is 5% is equal to 5 out of 100 times 100%. So if I tell you what a percentage is, you should be able to write that out as a fraction. Solving equations. You have a calculator. If you have a scientific calculator, you can probably just put it into your calculator and it'll solve. But sometimes if you put it in wrong or you put it in slightly different than what it's supposed to be, you can actually get the wrong answer. The calculator will tell you the answer to what you put into it, not the answer to the question you necessarily want to be answered. Don't forget that. The basic steps for solving an equation are to place all the like terms on one side, isolate the variable you need, and solve for it, and then check your answer. So we'll do this one quickly as an example. We're going to place all like terms on one side. So we're going to get all the numbers on one side and all the x's on the other. To do that, we're going to subtract 8 from both sides. We're left with 2x here, and that is equal to 14 minus 8, which is 6. We're still trying to isolate this x. It's 2x, so we need to divide by 2. And that gives us x equals 3. Then you check your answer. Well, 2 
We fill in the three for the X. Is this true? Two times three is six, and six plus eight does equal 14, at least in this universe. So always make sure you check your answer and make sure that it makes sense. If solving equations is hard for you, it's okay. Let me know, because we will have to rearrange some equations. And it won't be too crazy. We're not doing calculus or anything like that. It's just basic algebra. But if it wasn't your friend, that's all right. So I would suggest that you do this learning check. You're going to solve the following equation for P1. You're actually going to see this equation towards the end of the course when we're doing gas law. So we're not doing this just for kicks. We're actually going to be rearranging equations and solving for things. I hope that doesn't make your heart skip a beat or make you sad. It's not that bad, I promise. So hit the pause button. Give it a try. I'm going to change up my pen color. I've been doing red. I feel like that's a little aggressive. When we're solving for P1. I like to circle the variable that I'm trying to isolate. And that reminds me of what I'm doing. I was trying to keep P1 on one side and everything else on the other side. That means we have to get rid of that V1. There you go. Just divide by V1, and that will isolate P1 on one side and everything else on the other. Finally, we're going to talk about graphs, and this is the last part of this section, and it's the last part of Chapter 1. So we're almost done, y'all. Graphs are great. They're a visual representation of a relationship between two variables. You're going to have two perpendicular axes, which means that you're going to have something that looks like this. The horizontal axis is the x-axis. The vertical axis is the y-axis. And then you, when you plot your point, if I put a point here, then that corresponds To whatever the values are on each of the axes. So in this case, it's 2 comma 2. Okay? Now each axis is going to have some kind of a label. So it could be meters, it could be liters, some kind of unit is going to be associated with each of these axes. Let's look at an actual graph. Okay? We have an actual graph of the volume of a balloon versus the temperature of the balloon. We're looking at the relationship between the two. On the x-axis, we've got temperature in Celsius. And on the y-axis, we've got the volume of the balloon. So how much air is in there, right? How, what, how big is the balloon puffed up? What we notice right away is that as you increase the temperature, you're also increasing the volume. The balloon gets bigger. Now we can see that because they have this nice visual of the different balloons, but if we look at, say, 20 degrees Celsius, you go to the y-axis and you look at the volume, it's 24 liters. If you go to 60 degrees Celsius, we're somewhere in the ballpark of 27 liters. So that's increasing. That means there's a direct relationship. When the X goes up, the Y goes up too. That's a direct relationship. You can use this graph to figure out the volume at various temperatures. So we've got data points, which are the little red dots. But let's say that you had a different temperature that you wanted to read. 
that's not a straight line, but you see what I'm trying to do. Let's say that you had maybe 35 or 37 degrees, not 40. You can just kind of go up, find the line, go across and say, okay, the volume would be approximately 25 liters based on this graph. So you should be able to read the different points. You should be able to um, identify which axis is which, the X and the Y. If I ask you to look at a graph and, you know, kind of figure out where something would lie, if I said, okay, 65 degree temperature, what's the estimate of what the balloon volume would be? You should be able to do that. The other thing I want to draw your attention to on this graph is the fact that it has a title. And that title is descriptive. It tells you what you're going to be seeing. Each graph should always have a title that tells you what you're looking at. Likewise, each of the axes should be labeled. So we know that the X is temperature and that temperature is in Celsius. And the Y is volume and that volume is in liters. So there's a lot of information on a graph. It's a great way to take a lot of information and compress it into something that's easier to digest. But you need to be able to interpret the graph and unpack all of those details. This slide just says kind of what I was talking about on the previous slide. If you're someone who likes to have specific words to write down, this slide is great if you want to print it out and slap it in your notebook, or if you want to copy it down verbatim, that's fine too. But I wanted to do it both ways versus just reading this and being like, all right, well, I can read, can you? <laughs> I, I don't like to do that. Um, so we will talk about chapter one in class on Tuesday. We'll talk about study skills. We'll also talk about the syllabus, mastering chemistry, these chapter check-ins. So your first assignments, are not going to be due until August 30th. So everything for chapter one will be due then. What we're gonna do is you need to re watch these lectures and take notes or read the textbook, whatever you wanna do to prepare to be able to do practice problems on the chapter that's listed on the syllabus. That's what you need to do. So come ready to work. Make sure you have a calculator, pen, pencil, or something to do some writing. And um, I'll see you there. Look forward to meeting you all. Have a great one.